name is Jeremy Fioravanti. I'm president of the Delaware County Institute of Science. I'm a professor at a Harrisburg Area Community College in the biology department. I want to welcome you to our first Zoom lecture of the winter lecture series uh, for the 2022-23 season. This uh, digital presentation is no small feat for an all-volunteer organization that was founded in 1833 with a building from 1867 and an all-volunteer pour down in the heart of Media, Pennsylvania. I encourage you all attending this evening to become members and get involved in any capacity that you're able to, projects, donations, uh, to contribute to the further sustainability of our organization. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Daniel King of Drexel and Dr. Gurton for their um, promotion and support of this lecture series. Without them, it would uh, not be possible. I um, just want to remind you to come back for our next speaker, which will be a Zoom on January 9th. It'll be here before you know it with the holidays. So if you enjoy this format, we Hope to see you back in about a month. And with that, I'll just say, Dr. Gurton, please introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Jeremy. And again, good evening to everyone. So tonight's speaker is Dr. Katherine Haas, who's an assistant professor of biology at Austin P. State University, coming to us from Tennessee. Yes. So she has a bachelor's in wildlife biology, a master's in conservation biology, PhD in interdisciplinary ecology. You might get a sense of where this lecture is going tonight. Yeah. Uh, she has worked in, with many ecological systems. She has worked with moose in upstate New York. She has worked with wolves in Yellowstone National Park. She has worked with manatees in Florida Everglades. And she has completed postdoctoral research at Montana State University, where she looked at the energetics of white nose syndrome in Western bat species. Uh, tonight, though, we're going to learn a little bit more about what she is doing with white nose syndrome in Southeastern bats. So Dr. Haas, I'm gonna turn this right on over to you. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and we should be good to go. Yes, wonderful. Um, I thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I always like the opportunity to chat about the work that my lab is doing. Um, as she mentioned, I am at Austin Peay State University in Tennessee. I've been there for about three and a half years. I've had a few graduate students come in, in and out. And so I'm going to be talking about um, their work and what the work that I'm still working on from my postdoc and the work that we will be working on continuing in the next couple of years. But before I do that, I really wanted to talk about the basic biology of bats, why we need bats, what's going on with bats, and what white nose syndrome is, which is a pretty devastating disease um, that we have uh, in North America and I know is, is pretty prevalent in Pennsylvania. So I also want to point out that I do have my contact information up here, including my lab Twitter and my lab website and my email. I'm always happy to chat with people about our research and about my students' research, as well as if you have any young folks who are interested in this field. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, didn't really know that much about ecology when I was looking for uh, colleges. This is pre-internet. I mean, there was still internet, but not as much as there is today. So I'm always very excited to talk to um, there's young people who are interested potentially in this field and are not necessarily sure how to get into there. So um, as I mentioned, I want to talk about bats in general and discuss um, some basic biology. So bats are mammals. I do think that sometimes people don't realize that bats are not birds. They actually are a group of mammals. So they have fur, they have mammary glands, they give birth to live births to so their mammals just like us. Um, they are not flying mice. They actually are more related to humans than they are to other uh, to rodents. They're in a separate group of mammals called Chiroptera, which actually is Latin for hand wing. Um, we have about over 1,200 bat species, and this number uh, increases by the year. Um, a lot of our bat species are endemic and fairly super secretive. And so we, I think, are always sort of identifying more and more bat species every year. Um, they are the second most diverse mammal group of mammals after rodents in the world. So about 25% of all mammals on the planet are actually comprised of bats. Um, 
Most of the bats that we have in North America, about 70% of them are insectivorous, which means they eat insects. And because they're found in these temperate regions, they have very different habitat uses in the summer and in the winter. So in the summer, most of the time, these bats are found, um, you know, when they're not flying around at night looking for food, they're roosting in trees, um, they're hanging out under bark, they hang out in our barns and our man-made structures. And then in the winter, you have some really interesting behaviors, um, including hibernation and migration. And so most of the bats in temperate parts of North America, where it does get pretty cold during the winter, do hibernate. And we have a few species that will migrate. And I'll talk about why and what hibernation is throughout this talk. Um, but I wanted to really focus on this idea of the hand wing. And this is really important. This is the wing of the bat. And I always like pointing this out to people who aren't bat biologists because I think people don't understand this is actually the bat's hand. So you have the thumb here. This is their forearm. You have a wrist um, here. And I'm hoping you can see my pointer. I'm actually gonna see if I can get my uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, my little laser pointer here. This is the, like I said, the for, uh, the forearm. We got the, the thumb and you have your phalanges and your fingers. And connecting these fingers is um, two layers of skin, essentially. This is very thin vascular tissue. There's a lot of capillaries and vascular systems in this tissue. And this is really important for bats in terms of respiration and um, water loss, because when bats are flying, their energy is pretty extreme and they tend to overheat and they need a way of sort of respira uh, respiration and sort of dissipating that heat because they essentially our, their metabolism is, is so fast when they're flying. Um, what's also really interesting about this, the, this bat wing is the reason, um, the coolest part about bats being, having their, their wing as their hand is that unlike birds that are pretty fairly unidirectional in how they fly, um, bats can actually curve their uh, their wings around almost like grasping like a hand and allows them to really maneuver. And this is really important if you think about most bats being insectivorous, meaning they have to fly after these very uh, agile, small insects, and they have really cool adaptations in order to do that. So as I mentioned, most of the bats uh, across the globe are insectivorous. Almost all the bats we have in North America are insectivorous. So we have about 47 bat species in North America and 42 of them eat insects. Um, and, uh, but this isn't the only food resources that bats eat. So we do have bats that eat fruit and nectivorous. So a lot of our tropical bats, bats that are found in South America, um, in Australia, in Africa, they um, eat primarily fruit and, um, and or nectar. We do have some bat species that also eat vertebrates and fish. So they'll eat small mammals, snakes, um, amphibians. So some of our bats in the Southwest um, that kind of border on Mexico do eat things like frogs and fish. And then there are the, your blood eating bats, right? Your, your vampire bats. There's actually only two vampire bats in the entire world. So I think bats in general get a bad rap because most people think that they drink blood, but it's only about two of them. So that's, it's pretty rare form of that. But insectivory is the main way that bats eat. And because of the fact they eat insects, they have adapted um, things like echolocation. Now, now, not all bat species echolocate, if they don't eat insects, many of them don't. Um, and we have actually seen echolocation evolve separately in two different lines of bats, your fruit eating bats and insectivorous bats, which is kind of really cool. And because of things like echolocation where bats will send out a signal and then receive it back and use that to navigate, they have some really funky faces. And I always love showing this picture when I talk to, to younger students because they kind of get really excited, but, um, it really shows the evolution of how bats can echolocate. And so you have really crazy looking satellite dishes on their faces because they need a way of receiving that signal they send out when they're echolocating. And you can usually tell about a bat species if they're they are insectivorous bats or if they eat things like fruit because you get very different faces. So you tend to see these flying fox looking like bats, which I think make their way, their way around Facebook and YouTube with they're all cuddled up and cute eating fruit. They don't need to echolocate. They have larger eyes so they can see. They don't rely on that echolocation. You got some really 
fun leaf nose looking bats here because that is how they actually absorb that that um that signal back into essentially to navigate is they actually a lot of times will absorb it into their um their jaw bones and that is why they have these really cool satellite dishes on their faces and because they're insectivores most bat species they actually save the agricultural industry lots and lots of money so um one of the main reasons that I argue why we should care about bats and bat conservation is because of this economic input output. Um, I think in general, as scientists, we tend to, you know, say we should just care about these species because they are ecologically important, and they are. Um, but I think when you're kind of commu uh, communicating that to the public, it's it is good sometimes to put a number on it. And so, bats save the agriculture industry you know, about three to four billion dollars a year in free pesticides. So it's not only beneficial in the fact that, you know, agricultural industries don't need to spend money on pesticides, which then of course increases our food resources in terms of cost, but it also decreases the amount of pesticides we're putting out in the environment, which we know can have dire consequences. Um, our frugivorous, our nectivorous bats are actually re really important as well for ecological surfaces. So, uh, so they are important for seed dispersal and pollination. And I always joke, especially with my 21 and older crowd, that if you like tequila and margaritas, you got to love bats because agave, which is what tequila is made out of, is primarily solely pollinated by bat species. So we have um, really important ecological components uh, to uh, these, these bat species. Um, we also have really cool technology that we can glean from bats. And so echolocation, which I'll talk about with a little bit more in the next slide, is essentially sending out a signal and receiving it back. And this can be really helpful to understand how this works in the terms of things like military. Um, and so here's an example of an echolocation signal where a bat is essentially emitting a call at a pretty low uh, frequency. Um, and then that call bounces back from an object and then the bat will be able to know what direction that object is in. And what's really cool about recording these calls is we can actually tell to a point what bat species are making the calls based on the characteristics about what kilohertz they are, as well as the shape of this curve. So gleaning this information can be really, really cool in terms of technology. And then finally, um, not so much in North America, but in other parts of the world, a lot of uh, cultures and communities rely on bat guana or bat poop for things like fertilizer and fuel. And some communities in South America and in Africa, um, that's pretty much their only source of fuel is going out and um, sort of harvesting this bat guano. So as I mentioned, um, bats in general are you know, important, but they are facing some declines. And so we have about 47 bat species in North America. 42 of them, remember, are insectivores, and that's really important when we talk about white nose syndrome. Of those 47 species, about 20 of them are of concern. And what this means is that either their populations are declining or we don't have a lot of information about them. Um, six of the 47 are currently listed, listed as endangered um, federally, and we're actually going to probably be adding three more in the next year. Um, of that, these again, this is just federal endangered. We do have state level threatened and endangered species, meaning that across their entire range in North America, the species is doing okay but in certain areas, their populations have completely plummeted. And this is really the case in white nose syndrome. We talk about it's spread across North America. It's not everywhere yet. And so in some parts of these species ranges, they're doing okay, but in other parts, they're, they're not. Um, and we do have, and in Pennsylvania as well, you do have almost all of these bat species, except for the Florida bonneted bat, which is exclusive to Florida, and your Mexican long-nosed bat, which is primarily found in areas like Texas and, and Mexico. 
And so in terms of those threats to bat species, there's a lot of things going on, right? So in general, bats are pretty long lived relative to their body size. So most similar size mammals, if you think about mice, they only live to be about one or two years old. They have lots of young and they can reproduce pretty frequently. So your basic house mouse that you see in your house, um, they can have anywhere from three to seven litters a year. And each of those litters can have anywhere from five to 10 um, mice. So that can be as much as 70 offspring from a single female. Bats don't do that. Bats will have one and potentially two offspring a year, but sometimes it doesn't even happen every year. Um, and because of that, they are very sensitive to population declines due to single mortality events. We know that in general, prior to white nose syndrome, which is again, I'll talk about in a little bit, um, habitat destruction, human disturbance to habitat, um, pollution has been a really primarily issue. A lot of our bat species in North America rely on trees for some part of their life cycle. And due to things like land use change and agriculture, they have lost a lot of those, those trees. And the red bat here is this particular example. They're not impacted by white nose, um, but they are severely impacted by deforestation. And then finally, we have this disease called white nose syndrome. So white nose syndrome is the most devastating disease any mammal species has encountered in our lifetime. And I do apologize that there will be a few not so nice pictures today, but I wanted to kind of really show how devastating this disease can be. So this disease is caused by a fungus, and this fungus is not native to North America. This fungus is native to Eurasia. So this fungus naturally occurs in Europe and Asia, and white nose syndrome occurs very, very infrequently in these areas because the bats in these areas have evolved with this fungus. Um, we're not 100% sure how this fungus got to the United States. Um, there's rumors about people bringing soil from France to make cheese in a cave and brought the fungal spores. We're not 100% sure what happened. But it was first discovered in um, upstate New York in a cave in Albany in 2006. And since 2006, for the past 16 years, it has spread to 33 US states and seven Canadian provinces. It affects about 12 uh, bat species, and all of those bat species are insectivores. Um, this number of over 6 million bats in individuals have died. That was the number that you know I first read when I started studying bats in 2016. So in the last six years, I know there has been a lot more that have died, but it's just very hard for us to really quantify the, the number of bats that have died. But what happens is, and I'll talk about, you know, the biology behind white nose syndrome, but it is a problem that if a cave or a uh, mine or a hibernacula, which is the area where bats hibernate, if that hibernacula gets this fungus, then ultimately, you know, upwards of 90%, if not 100% of the bats in that cave will die from white nose syndrome. And you get these mass mortality events. And it's called white nose syndrome because again, it's, it's caused by a fungus. This fungus grows really well in cool, moist environments, which is like the perfect environment of a cave where bats hibernate. And this fungus grows on the wing and the nose tissue of the bat and causes what we see as this white nose. So it was first found, as I mentioned, in Albany here, and it has since spread westward. Now the colors are uh, essentially the years of, of when this happened. So you can see it, it was moving westward. Um, because it's caused by this fungus, this fungus can grow in the cave dirt and substrate. It can grow and persist even when a bat is not around. It can hang out on our clothes. And so the first couple of years, white nose syndrome, specifically the fungus, was spread from cave to cave because of bat biologists, because we go and we do surveys during the winter. Now we have a lot more protocols to prevent spread, and it has definitely slowed down. But I started studying bats when I was living in Montana out in 2016, and none of this Western US had white nose syndrome yet, and now we do. So it's, it's getting to be a problem in most of um, the US.
Now, um, to kind of talk about how whiteness syndrome impacts that species and why it's so deadly, I need to really focus on hibernation energetics. And this is this is what I get excited about. So most of our bat species that are insectivores, specifically in northern North America, um, essentially have a food resource that is not there during the winter, right? So in areas where it gets cold and when where temperatures get to be below freezing, our ectotherm insects essentially either, um, you know, they don't necessarily hibernate, but they will go into dormant or they will die, right? So these bats do not have a food resource and they deal with this lack of food through hibernation. So hibernation is not sleeping. So I, I got to put that out there first, right? Bats are not sleeping when they're in hibernation. It's also not a steady state. Rather, hibernation is this long-term uh, physiological process of torpor and arousals. Torpor is when a bat or any hibernating animal will drop its body temperature to be pretty, pretty low and their metabolism also drops down pretty low. And then they, every, every now and then they'll bring their body temperature back up to no, normal levels. So this figure here is an example. We have time on the x-axis over winter and, and y is temperature. So we're going to speak Celsius terms here because this is science. So most mammals are about 38 to 39 degrees Celsius. When bats go into torpor, they will drop their body temperature to be near air temperature. And they do this because it reduces how much heat they're losing into the environment. If you have a hot cup of coffee and you walk out into 80 degree weather, you're probably not gonna lose too much heat from that coffee, right? It's gonna take a while for that coffee to cool down. If you go out to, and it's 30 degrees, that coffee is gonna cool down pretty quickly because that difference between the coffee temperature and the air is very, very large and heat goes from cold to, to excuse me, from hot to cold. So if you are a 30 39 degree Celsius body in temperatures that are, you know, 10 or 5 degrees Celsius, you're going to be losing a lot of heat to the environment. As warm-blooded mammals, you're going to be spending a lot of energy to try to maintain that body temperature, just like us. Now, if you can drop your body temperature down to be at air temperature, you're not going to lose any energy. And you also don't have to expend that much to keep that low body temperature. So you can see here, and this is of course, ecology It's not always that clean, but um, we do have these traces of body temperatures from different bats. And so bats will keep a pretty low temperature about 10 degrees. And then you can see every now and then they, they send it back up, right? And we're not 100% sure why bats will, and other, um, hibernators will come up from torpor. We do know it's very energetically costly. And so these very short periods, so they'll, they'll bring their body temperatures up to normal hour, two hours max, and they'll go back down into torpor. Um, and this is ex extremely energetically costly. So when bats are in hibernation, they have basically all the fat they have when they start hibernation, right? So they spend all summer and fall getting chubby. We call them little chicken nuggets because they're just these big chubby bats. And then they go into hibernation and that's all the food, essentially energetic resources they have throughout the winter. So they don't need to eat anymore. So when they go through these periods of arousals where they bring their body temperature back up, they have to spend a lot of energy to increase their metabolism and to warm their body tissue up. So even though these periods of arousals are about 5% of the entire winter time, they can cost as much as 95% of their entire energy budget. So that's if you got paid once a year and 95% of your budget you blew in like 5% of that time. Now, as I mentioned, we're not 100% sure why hibernators do this, but one of the main things we think is happening um, is that bats get dehydrated. Um, so they have all the food they have, all the energy they have, but they don't have all the water they have. And we think that bats and other hibernators arouse to essentially replenish those water sources. And one of the main reasons why we think this now is because white nose syndrome dehydrates bats and we're seeing this increase in these arousals. So white nose syndrome, as I mentioned, is caused by this fungus. This fungus grows really well in cold, moist environments, such as a bat cave. Throughout the winter, it will essentially grow on the bat and eat away at that really important wing tissue. And it essentially causes them to get dehydrated pretty quickly because 
before you had this very large surface area where evaporative water loss was happening there, that was a benefit. Now you have root, you know, pretty much remove that important barrier of skin. Skin's really important. Um, and now these baths are essentially losing a lot more water to the environment. And we see this change, their hibernation behavior. And so here is another one of those temperature traces where we have time on the x-axis, temperature on the y. These top two bats here are healthy bats. And you can see the bat has it's by temperature down in torpor, it comes out for a very short arousal period, goes back down to torpor, comes back out. And you can see these torpor bouts are actually pretty, pretty stable in terms of the amount of time. And if we have a bat that's living in a pretty stable environment, it's losing water at the same rate, then it would make sense that it would essentially arouse every two weeks or so. On the bottom two graphs, we have a bat with white nose syndrome. As you can see, as winter progresses, those numbers of arousals increases. And it increases because that fungus is continually growing, digesting more of that wing tissue. They're losing more and more water to the environment and they have to arouse a lot more frequently to replenish those water sources. And what happens is, again, all the food the bat has and that energy and fat is all they have is what they had at the beginning of winter. If they expend those fat resources before winter is done and there's actually food on the landscape, then these bats end up becoming emancipated and they starve to death. And that is why we see these extremely mass mortality events because um, these bats get the fungus, they can't groom it off, there's no food resources for them available, and they end up um, starving to death. And it's, it's not very, very, very pretty and it's pretty sad. So um, my current lab in Tennessee is trying to tackle a few questions that are related to white nose syndrome. There's been so much research in the last 15 years about um, how white nose syndrome and how this fungus alters their behavior. And so we're kind of trying to fill in some gaps um, here in Tennessee. So I have a lab of wonderful students. I feel extremely lucky to have some great students here and I'll talk about some of their research um, in the next couple slides, I have two undergraduate students, Dakota and Kennedy. So they're actually not working on bats, they're working on small mammals, but they will be hopefully joining the bat team. We're getting some more funding hopefully in June and we'll be able to move them to the bat project. Um, Brandon and Leah, I'll talk about their research. They just started this semester, so we have some of their work going forward. And then Sarah, she graduated from a master's, the master's program back in May in my lab. And so I'll be talking about what she found as well as two of her, one of her colleagues who is not pictured because she has, you know, got a job and moved away from us. Um, and then this is Jessica. She was a technician and she isn't in my lab anymore, but she still works for Austin P, but she's doing insect works. I guess mammals were too boring for her. But almost all of the work that my lab has been doing since I got to Austin P has actually been focused in Tennessee and in Kentucky, um, mainly on an army base called Fort Campbell. So Fort Campbell is on the border of Tennessee and Kentucky. We're in middle Tennessee here. And the reason that most of my research has focused on Fort Campbell is um, Fort Campbell is, I don't remember the number of acres, but about 80% of it is forested. So it's a great place for bats. Um, also, because we do have some endangered species in the Southeast, being federal lands, Fort Campbell legally has to do research to show that they do or they don't have these endangered species. And if they do have these endangered species, they have to be able to manage for them. And that works really well when your university is right next to Fort Campbell because then they can reach out and say, hey, like we have all this money for you and your grad students to come and do research. So when someone literally hands you money, then you take it. And I just happened to be working with bats. So it worked out wonderfully. I also have a very, um, I also have a project that we're working on in Texas, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And so some of the projects that I'll talk about today are um, looking at habitat selection for microclimate, looking at the impacts of white nose syndrome, reproduction, and climate, um, looking at how predation in bats can impact foraging in bats, um, how bat boxes and microclimates can be um, you know, really uh, inferential to that. Um, 
We are and also looking at this survival in non-traditional hibernacula, which is the work that we're doing in Texas. So in general, my students go out during the summer and um, we do a lot of our research and misnetting and collecting bad information during the summer months. And because Fort Campbell is such a large chunk of land, we can't just go out and net anywhere for bats, right? So we have to uh, use our time wisely. And we do use these acoustics, and that is the way that you can record those echolocation calls of bats and use software, as I mentioned, to determine what species of bats are there. And that allows us to figure out what are some areas where there are there are concentrated areas of these bats where we can um, go out and and you know and try to figure out where they are. So most of the time we set up these um, acoustics and our nets along these flyways. So along rivers, along streams, along roads and trails. Now, um, something I found really interesting working on an army base is there's areas that you cannot go into or else you might step on like a buried mine. So that's always something that we have to keep in mind when we're, um, you know, planning something in an army base. So this is, an again, an example of our uh, acoustic sensors. We can vary the height based on what species we find and where they're located. And what happens is it we, we can identify the species based on the the frequency of the call and that shape of that call. Once we have an area where we know there are a few different species there or the target species, depending on what study we're doing is there, then we'll go out and we'll set up these mist nets. It's a little hard to see, but the bottom here there is between these two poles is black monofilament line. And what we'll do is we'll set up these two poles across a stream, a road, a fire break, and then um, we will set this net up and this entire area will be a basically a very large net. So we want to essentially paint their entire flyway with this monofilament net so that way the bats will catch there into there. This is about 10 meters I believe tall and it's probably my least favorite thing about field work is setting up these guys. I love all the other stuff but these things can be a pain in the butt, butt to set up. And so once we set these up will go out every 10 minutes at night and um, catch bats. And so once we catch a bat, you can see here, this is a red bat and that's my grad student branding pulling it out. If you can get to the bat pretty quickly, they're actually really easy to pull out of the net without hurting them. Um, I think birds are a lot harder. I've watched birders pull, pull birds out of the nets, same type of nets. Bats are so much easier because they don't have all the wing feathers to deal with. Um, so you can pull them out pretty quickly. Uh, so just something to note, all of the bat handlers are vaccinated against rabies, so don't ever touch a bat because rabies is a thing. Um, we also are all trained, we have proper permits, we have all the proper pr protocols. And we are pretty quick in our processing because we don't really want to stress the bat out as, as much anymore than we have to. Um, we have a field table or the back of the pickup truck bed set up, and we have people taking notes. We pretty much take as much data as we can because with any wildlife study, if you have an animal in hand, you don't want to waste that stress you're putting on the animal and get as much information as you can. So we'll um, identify the species, we'll sex the bat, we'll try to age it. They can be difficult to age. Uh, we'll look for reproductive status. Is it pregnant? Is it lactating? We'll look at the wing health to see if there's any damage from white nose syndrome. Um, we take a bunch of other body measurements. And then one of the main things that we have been doing over the last couple of years is actually tracking these bats to figure out what habitats they use. Now we specifically have been tracking the tricolored bat because the tricolored bat is one of the bats that is most devastated by white nose syndrome. They are the smallest bat we have in the Southeast. They're about five grams. It's about the weight of a quarter. Um, it's pretty small. And um, they will be listed as an endangered species in June of this coming year. So we wanna know as much as we possibly can about these species. So we've been putting on these little tiny telemetry trackers. Um, these guys are about 0.2 grams. 
they're really tiny. Um, if you do any wildlife work, you know that, or in general, I should say, any animal work, you don't want to put anything on an animal that will stress it out. So we're pretty limited on what we can put on bats because they're so small. Um, you know, I've done work studying moose where you can put everything on them because they're so large, right? So these telemetry sensors send out a um, signal that we can go track. And unfortunately, because they're so small, the signal only lasts about seven to to 10 days, so we don't get a lot of information, but it's definitely more than we have. We will glue this, the transmitter onto the back using surgical glue. It's the same stuff they use to sew up us up, and it ends up dissolving after a couple days, so it, it, it's not really detrimental to the bat at all. So once we let the, go bat, the bat go at night, the next day and until we lose a signal, we will go out with the receiver and an antenna and search for this bat. And as you can see in this far right image, um, <clears throat> you can kind of see the little antenna sticking out of this leaf litter. So my, uh, my graduate students have the best eyes and are pretty spectacular in finding these bats. This is something that is pretty difficult to do. And I feel, again, really lucky my students have been pretty spectacular in finding these bats. Once they find a bat, they will, they took a lot of information about the tree in which that bat was roosting on. Now, this is all summer work. We know these bats go into caves during hibernation, but summer is just as important to get those fat resources before they go into hibernation. So we've been trying to figure out what are the things that are important for these trees that these bats use during the summer. And this is my grad student, Sarah. This was her master's thesis. She also just graduated in May. And she went out and measured, I don't even know how many trees, so many trees. <laughs> she was a trooper and measured all of these informations about this. And we did a lot of statistics. And what we found out of all the measurements she found, the only thing that was important to these bats was height. And that to me, she was sort of dismayed of, it's just tree height. And to me, the first thing I thought of is microclimate. And that is, we know extremely important to bats is temperature. They are a heterothermic animal, right? So they can vary their body temperature. They're not like normal mammals that can maintain, I mean, they can maintain that steady temperature, but they don't have to. That's why they're able to hibernate. And so we think that with very tall trees, you have a variety of microclimates available to this bat, and therefore they're able to reduce their energetic needs by becoming heterothermic and adjusting their body temperature based on this tree height. So this is something we're actually going to test, um, hopefully in the next couple of years, got a grad student on this, and they'll be actually to test, is it microclimate? Does that vary? How do these bats use this temperature rather than us just looking at habitat, but can we actually get at that mess mechanistic piece? My next student sort of furthered on looking at the energetics component. And this was looking at the impacts of whiteness syndrome on reproduction. Now, um, this is really, really interesting in bats, and this is because bats are one of those species that can delay reproduction. And what this means is that during the life cycle of a bat, they will mate in the fall when they're swarming before hibernation, because the males are pretty much at their peak fitness because they've been gaining fat for hibernation and um, they'll mate. But then females will store the sperm and will not fertilize their eggs until later in the year um, after hibernation is pretty much over. And then they'll have gestation and lactation. And they do this because lactation is extremely energetically costly in mammals. And if your babies are born in October, before you go into a place where there's no food, that's not really great for your babies. So they can time essentially birth at that peak food resources. And what my grad student was interested in looking at is how does white nose syndrome over this period influence reproduction? Now we're unable to follow bats and see if they're pregnant and see if they give birth. We can't do that. So she was able to gather a bunch of data from across the Southeast and just look at numbers of reproductive females over time and how that might've been influenced by white nose syndrome. And we, she looked at, um, a bunch of these individuals and looked at proportion because we noticed once white nose syndrome became a thing, we went out and did a lot more research. So we can't just look at raw numbers in terms of going out every year to 
um, see if that number decreased because we started going out a lot more after white nose. So we had to look at proportion. As you can see here, X, that uh, axis is time and proportion of that particular species group for that county, uh, excuse me, in that particular state per, for the year. And this top line here are our white nose syn uh, syndrome susceptible species. As I mentioned before, when I point out the picture of a red bat, red bats are Lazarius borealis. They're not, they don't hang out in caves. They don't get white nose syndrome. So we were just using that as sort of a control. And then big brown bats of Tessicus, they do go in caves, but they don't get white nose syndrome. And we don't really know why yet. And we're trying to figure that out. As you can see, their populations actually started to increase with white nose syndrome um, in the Southeast, which was right about here. And we think that perhaps this is some competitive exclusion that was happening and competitive release. Can't actually say that because we didn't actually test for it, but we did see that the number of reproductive females started decreasing with white nose syndrome. And we can look at this broken out by the species between non-reproductive and reproductive. And in white nose syndrome um, susceptible species, pre-white nose syndrome were a lot larger. We lost a lot with um, Post white nose syndrome. Now, of course, this uh, this is just sort of preliminary work. Her paper, both of these papers, will hopefully be coming out next year. Um, so, if you're extremely interested, you can kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and so, now I'm just going to talk about some of the work that we are going to be doing or starting to do. Um, one of my pet projects that I'm really interested in is the impacts of microclimate of artificial roosts. And what I mean by that is looking at bat boxes. Bat boxes are a really important management tool. Um, if you have bats that live in your house or your barn, if you talk to a bat biologist, the first thing they're gonna say is make a bat box. But there's been some research over the last five-ish years that have been showing that bat boxes potentially overheat. And this is something as someone who is interested in energetics and thermal ecology, I'm really interested in. So we've put out a bat, bunch of bat boxes across um, the county that I live in and we're, I'm currently working with some engineering students and we're gonna actually build these uh, infrared photo gates that we can put on the bat boxes that will essentially be triggered like a motion sensor camera anytime a bat goes in and out of the bat box and we can record the temperature at which that bat box is and that will be able to tell us if these bats are perhaps overheating or not um, but this is because I don't have a grad student on this project it's something that you know it's slowly working I, I found that I need students to do the work because I don't really have the time to do it anymore so this is just something that I'm interested in and we're kind of slowly putting this together. Um, I also have a grad student, Brandon, who is really interested in the impacts of perceived predation on bats. Now, I've talked a lot about, about the research that you know exists, what we know with white nose syndrome, we know bats are impacted by land use change, they're impacted by wind energy with um, turbines but we don't really know how much they're impacted by their actual natural predators. Um, we know that predators such as owls and blue jays will opportunistically forage on bats, but we don't really know how this might impact their foraging activity of the bats themselves. We can't really go out and measure um, predation rates, but we can impact, look at the impact on foraging. And what I mean by this is whether or not a bat actually is killed by a predator, it still can impact them if they think there is a risk of predation. So my grad student has developed uh, this, uh, this experimental design that he will deploy this coming summer, and he will put out a bunch of these acoustic data loggers. It's a great way to collect data um, without having to handle a bat. And this will, he'll be putting them out about 30 sites across Fort Campbell, and he will be recording foraging activity, so um, how much foraging is happening, where they're foraging, how long, excuse me, bats are foraging. And then he will add some treatments to this. He will add uh, predator uh, visual cues. So those nice predation mount, uh, nice predator owl mounts you put in your garden. Um, he will add uh, MP3 players, 
uh, using uh, uh, predator sounds to see if it's an audio thing that might influence uh, foraging of bats. And then um, we actually will also have recordings of distressed bat sounds because it's potentially something that bats might have evolved adaptation to respond to other bats issues as a co-evolution um, aspect. So this, as I mentioned, is something we will be doing um, in the next year or so, and he'll be working through this. And I'm extremely excited to have the opportunity to, to dive into something that we don't really know that much about. And then finally, I wanted to add, um, end with the one non-Tennessee project that I'm working on. Um, this is going to be looking at how non-traditional hibernacula are allowing certain bat species to survive whiteness syndrome. Um, so this is my grad student, Leah, and she's pointing out another tricolor bat. So again, we've been focusing on tricolor bats. These are species, again, that the species will be listed as endangered. And it's pretty, very, very um, increasingly mortality events are happening with these species because of white nose syndrome. They tend to uh, roost in your caves and culverts in some areas of the Southeast. But what we found is that there are parts of East Texas where there are these, this bat species that's roosting in these culverts and is not succumbing to whiteness syndrome at all. And the fungus is there, we've found it there. We just do not know why this species isn't dying from whiteness syndrome. And so my student Leah will be asking this question of what's going on. And um, this is again, the stuff that I get really excited about looking at disease and energetics. And so to kind of understand what potentially can be happening and what I mean by non-traditional hibernacula is you really need to understand that with um, bats that are in uh, these caves, they're roosting in these pretty stable environments and they're usually most of the time 100% relative humidity. Culverts are probably not stable and they probably are can be dry, especially in Texas. Now we know the white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus and this fungus grows really well in cooler, stable, moist environments. So it's possible that these um, non-traditional hibernacula that are not stable are not really moist and, and uh, saturated cannot be the best place for this fungus to grow. So we look at this disease triangle, which incorporates the impact of the pathogen on the host and then the environment on both of those things. And we know already the range of temperatures in which this fungus grows really well in. Um, we have temperature on the x-axis here and fungal growth weight rate on the y. So fungi the fungus grows really well from about 10 to 15-ish degrees Celsius. Most bat caves are between five and 15 degrees Celsius. Um, but it's possible that our hibernacula down in Texas are not. And so we have some very preliminary data that has shown a temperature in red-ish orange here on this uh, right y-axis that does get to be too warm for the fungus. But what's also interesting is we have bat calls on this left y-axis. They are going out and foraging. So it's also possible that there's food out there and they're able to feed more often um, and maybe supplement that fat that does not allow them to starve to get death with white nose. So in addition to this, we're hoping to get um, some ability to grow the fungus in the lab to be able to test how that fungus potentially could grow in this environment to see if this environment, this non-traditional hibernacula doesn't really grow that well. And uh, if that's the case, it would actually be really interesting and provide us some information of why certain bat species, like the big brown bat, which I talked about, um, are surviving when others aren't. And it brings into this idea of the rescue effect and why perhaps some of the bat species that are in Eurasia that have this pathogen naturally are not as impacted. And this is sort of the hypothesis that I and my lab has been focusing on. And so I wanna kind of go through this. This is from a paper that came out last year. It's a really great paper about um, white nose syndrome in bats. 
And you have this environmental gradient on the x-axis and then just the frequency of individuals in that particular habitat. So let's just say this is temperature on the x-axis. If you have a native species like a bat, most of them are going to be um, hanging out around the mean of the best environment for these bats. And then you have some that are in cooler environments and some that are in warmer environments. If you have a fungus that comes in or another type of pathogen, that pathogen itself has a range of climate it can survive in. Where those two overlap, you're going to have a lot of mortality. And where they don't overlap, you have the potential for um, adaptation to occur. So it's possible that bats that, sort of, that live in cooler environments or just choose cooler environments in their cave where the fungus cannot grow, if they survive and if that particular behavior is inherited and they can pass it along to their offspring, then it's possible that that behavior will persist in the environment and now you have the ability for the species to persist outside of the range of that particular pathogen. And we are seeing this. So, uh, you know, before this paper came out, I was presenting some work uh, from just modeling survival in the Western US. And we had biologists that, you know, were looking at our slides and just saying like, yeah, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing bats that are roosting in cooler environments that we no normally didn't see. They just are able to survive. And so this is an example here where you have time on the X axis and the temperature in the early winter on the Y. And um, we can see that bats are slowly, more individuals are slowly moving to cooler environments. Whether individuals are actively deciding to move or they just always were there and now we're just seeing them more because they're not dying relatively to everybody else. Um, and so this is something that we're gonna, you know, keep looking at, looking at this interaction between temperature and the fungal growth rates and survival of these bats and how microclimate can really influence um, population growth in these areas. So I always like to end my bat talks with how you can help, because I think a lot of times I get that, well, what can we do? Um, I'm still gonna say install bat houses, especially if you live in areas where there is deforestation or loss of important forests because of building houses or agriculture. Um, just avoiding areas where we know bats are during the winter when they're already stressed um, due to something like white nose. And then don't ever touch a bat if you see one, right? So you want to leave all bats alone and call your local rehab or wildlife agency or animal control even because they're all trained to, to, deal with, uh, to deal, to handle bats. And I always show this picture because I, I hate even seeing bat biologists handle bats without gloves because it's not something that we want to tell the, you know, the public that it's okay to, uh, to do this. So with that, I can take any questions. So I had a few questions here. Yeah. So that was fantastic, Dr. House. Thank you so much for yeah, that. I, thanks for I, having me didn't realize there was all that to bats and then yet so much yes. more. <laughs> so it sounds like you will be busy for quite some time. We had some questions come in on the registration yeah. form and I know okay. some people are putting questions in the chat too. So maybe I'll just start with the ones from the registration form, which okay. you, you hit on a, a, most of these already, but someone had posted a question uh, as there are treatments uh, for deer ticks that are put on feeding stations in some areas. Is there anything yeah. for the bats that can be done at the caves? Yes. So there is a lot of research that has gone into um, both treating the caves to prevent the fungus from growing, treating the bats prior to hibernation to prevent the bats from getting the fungus to cause whiteness syndrome, and then treating the bats that have whiteness syndrome. There is nothing yet that is, you know, been shown to work 100% of the time everywhere. Um, there is a lot of research, a lot of federal funding is going into that. My personal opinion is that just like the deer tick, because I actually used to work looking at Lyme and deer ticks and um, deer, 
in order for us to really eradicate it, it has to get every single bat. And that is just absolutely impossible. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. It's just, it's not gonna be a Hail Mary. What we do find is microclimate selection is really important and food is really important. And so there's been a lot of research, a lot of projects artificially trying to increase insects by caves. They put out a bunch of lights all across the, the Northeast. Actually, they're doing it. They call it the Fat Bat Project where they're just trying to attract insects to these environments so bats have a lot more resources to gain fat before going into hibernation, as well as modifying the, the environments in the caves and mines themselves to be areas where the fungus doesn't grow well. So yes, there is treatments. There are research into it. It's just not something we have really been able to apply uh, everywhere yet. Great, thank you. And so one of the early questions that came in the chat, do bats hibernate in the winter and yes. do without food? So you were yeah. able to bring us through that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, are any bat species immune to white nose? Yes. yes. So um, I'm not going to say they're immune because immunity is a whole separate thing. Um, and I'm not a disease ecologist. And I used, I used to work in a disease lab and they would yell at me if I use that term. We do know there are bats that don't get white nose syndrome in the North America, right? Um, these are bats that either don't hibernate. So we have some of those bats, as I mentioned, um, will migrate instead of hibernate. So white nose syndrome only impacts bats that are hibernating because of how it changes their behavior. If you have a bat that does not go into hibernation, it, it will cause, you know, the eating of the skin, but it's not that detrimental because those bat body temperatures where the fungus is growing is never going to get within that fungal range of temperatures. Um, but we do have bats that hibernate that don't get white nose. The red bat hibernates in trees, is never exposed to white nose syndrome because it has to grow in the caves where it's cooler. Um, we have the big brown bat, not sure why it doesn't really succumb to it. We think it has to do with the fact that big brown bats like really cold, weird temperatures. The fungus doesn't grow well. So there are bats that don't get it. Um, and we're actually using that as a study of, of why, like that non-traditional hibernacular of what's happening. Why aren't they succumbing to this? Can we use that to help others? Great. Another question here. I assume that the babies inherit the white nose syndrome when born? No, they don't. So um, the white nose syndrome is different from the fungus. White nose syndrome is caused by the fungus. The fungus hangs out in the cave all year round. Babies are born out. They will be born in a cave, but they're not hibernating. So they're not really going to be impact by, impacted by it yet. And if they're active body temperatures, the fungus can't grow on them. If they're going out and feeding in warm environments, the fungus can't grow on them. It won't be until the following winter until bats will really succumb to white nose. And it's basically in the cave, it's in the substrate, it's in you know the dirt of the cave. And that's essentially how bats can get that fungus. They also can get it from bat to bat contact because we do know bat species do, um, you know, they cluster and you can get, they can get contact to contact that way either. Um, a question about it affecting other animals. It doesn't affect other animals and it doesn't affect us. It only impacts hibernating bats. It won't impact other animals that use caves because they don't hibernate. And the whole point is that it, it's a, it's a, I think it's an interesting disease because it doesn't cause, you know, respiratory impacts. It doesn't cause something that you think a disease does. It's just a fungal issue that causes them to change their behavior. And that's what causes mortality. So it can impact humans at all. Um, it really only impacts hibernating bat species. Then it looks like we have maybe one final question and then you can see some of the comments in there um, okay. about how wonderful all this information is. And it's very encouraging to see all this research going on. But a uh, question, are bats sedated when collecting data on them? And if not, how do you keep them calm when you collect the data? Yes. <laughs> That's a great question. They're not sedated. Um, to, they're so tiny, it would be extremely hard to sedate a bat. You can, there are, you know, captive studies that do that, you know, work with vets that do sedation. Um, I've never really done sedation work with wildlife because you definitely need a veterinary degree to do that. Um, 
with most species of animals, once they're in like, it's hard to explain. So we take the bats from the, from the net and we put them in a bag. And once they're in a bag and that they're dark, they're, they're pretty calm. Um, we do this with a lot of other animal species. When I handle mice, you put them in a bag, they chill. If you ever see captive animals, um, like deer, a lot of times will cover their eyes and they calm down a little bit. Um, it, it also varies on the bat species. There are certain bat species that are a lot more chatty and angry, and then there are some that are pretty calm. And so we just try to handle them as little as possible. And once we have them in hand, we try to quickly measure the things we need to measure and then let them go to really not stress them out. Um, when we are doing work in the winter, a lot of times we'll actually give them food and water to deal with the fact that they are energetically stressed. In the summer, I like to give them Pedialyte um, because that's also something that we found they can get stressed out about with, with dehydration. But uh, the more practice you have handling an animal, the less stressful it can be. And the one thing I tell my, my students when they're learning is that the more delicate you are, the more stressful it is because they have more of an opportunity to get twisted. And if you are pretty firm and not, you know, squeezing them, but firm enough that they can't maneuver, it's the most healthiest thing for them to do. And I haven't done it with my students, but when I was a freshman and we first handled things, we were given actually dead animals and we were like, they basically asked us to break their bones and it helps us realize how much force is needed to really hurt an animal. And you wanna be, you know, collected in that and, and processing them quickly, strong, confident, and then let them go. And then they're, they're pretty much okay. Great. That is the end of the questions that have come in. Perfect. Thank you again for, yeah. for your talk. And Jeremiah, I will turn everything back over to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. What a, a wonderful talk this evening. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It was really good to see uh, everyone here uh, as we get close to the winter solstice and the, winter, the holiday season. I'd like to encourage you to participate virtually next month. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Haas one final time for coming this evening. Your earrings are wonderful. I know, <laughs> I, I have a bunch. <laughs> I can tell you're a great mentor by how you presented your talk. Um, but with that, I'd just like to uh, thank everybody and encourage you to come back on our next lecture will be January 9th and we'll be talking about space weather and solar storms. So, uh, and good luck with finals and, and Dr. Gurton and Dr. King, good luck with the conference I believe that you're at right now. So it's a very stressful time of year for scientists. So thank you for taking the time to, to uh, present Thank you. It. Thanks guys. Bye.